I'm Aaron Greenblatt, CEO of Iron Mill. Just some quick background before I begin on the slides here. I hold a double E PhD from Stanford, graduated in 2015. My thesis area was quaternion neural networks. After grad school, I went to a hedge fund to lead machine learning efforts. Did that for a little bit and said, you know, starting companies is more fun. I've been doing entrepreneurship since I've been a teenager. And so then came back to California, started a cybersecurity company. We worked very closely with the US Air Force on a zero trust file system that was powered by AI. And a couple years ago, my team switched into blockchain because there's just a lot of very interesting opportunities in this space. So with that, let me get started on the verifiable internet using zero knowledge. So look, 30 years ago, this cartoon came out. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, okay? And this was when I was a kid, right? And this was, when it came out, it wasn't really noticed, but then a few years later, you had things like AOL and people started laughing about it. But it's amazing how 30 years later, we're doing exactly the same thing because on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. That's still true. And, you know, look, that has some ramifications now that the internet is widely in use. So it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, right? You get phishing and botnets. Um, AI, AI is beautiful. Even when it's working, you don't know it's working because the models do funny things, right? Um, never mind if somebody's putting in adversarial patterns, adversarial models, and so on and so forth. And even the most basic protocols on the internet, I mean, BGP, you'd like to have routing tables. Now, we use digital signatures for that now, but the reality is that BGP mishaps have caused major internet outages. So what's cool is we get to reinvent all of this with ZK now and build an internet that you can really verify. So let's talk more about that, reinventing the internet with zero knowledge. The thing that zero knowledge does that is truly new and unique and that you just couldn't do before is you can build an identity on the internet while maintaining your privacy. And that's the part that's new. You could do identity before you used public key encryption, but here you can keep things private. And so if you combine identity and privacy, then all of a sudden you can start really thinking about reputation because the privacy allows you to build a robust reputation that you couldn't build before. Um, once you have these pieces in place, you know, reputation comes down to, I am a reputable thing, I am a reputable person, one or the other. A thing could be a system or a computer, a person is of course a person. So now you can think about every protocol that we use you can build in now a verifiable, trustworthy way because people have reputations. It's very similar to how when you live in a small town, you can't really get away with shenanigans because you're gonna go to the grocery store and everybody knows your face. When you live in a big city, life is different. So this really aligns with a lot of what we're doing in blockchain right now. Smart contract wallets, EIP 4337, but it also aligns with off-chain priorities too, things like privacy preserving social media. That's something you can actually build with a blockchain or without, but zero knowledge will be key to all of it. Also, reputation-based software-defined networking. This gets back to my BGP example earlier, that we can go reinvent the internet with protocols that you can trust but then verify. So I wanna do a quick survey here and talk about internet scale systems because if we're going to reinvent the internet, it's an internet scale system by definition, it's big. So first off, how many people here are cryptographers? Raise your hand. We must have a few. Really? There's one at the sound desk right there from Semiotic. Sevi, thank you, sir, for running sound for a moment. Okay, um, there are plenty of cryptographers around Stanford. I know you're here, okay. Um, developers, who here writes code but is maybe like less cryptography focused? Okay, good, more hands, great, okay. A whole bunch of you, that's awesome. And I'm sure there's investors here, yes? You guys provide the money. Um, there's not more investors, really? Okay, I'm sure there's more investors. There we go, some in the back, great. So provide money to make this ecosystem go, that's awesome. Now, who here is a data center operator? Is there anyone? 
Okay, I don't see any hands, and oh, there's one? There's one, hey, okay, data center operator, we got one, that's great. Um, and then who here is running on calls? So when you release a software product and it goes live and it has to really run 24-7, um, you know, imagine the 8.8.8.8 DNS server from Google. Who here gets called at two in the morning because it broke? Uh, okay, a couple people. <laughs> and then kind of more broadly, just who's a technical risk manager? So um, who thinks about deploying systems? Anybody who's in an on-call certainly is a technical risk manager. If you're a CISO at a Fortune 500 company, okay, so we have a few of those. Um, so I just wanna point out that the crowd is sort of disproportionately tilted towards developers and cryptographers. And, um, and so this, this leads to talking about dev versus ops, right? Because if we have this thing about DevOps, which over the last 15 years, we've built these excellent, excellent tools that let people write code and develop and deploy in one click and deploy reproducibly so that every deployment doesn't break. And so, you know, when people say DevOps, they think this big harmonious picture, but let's think about where, where you sit mentally when you're a developer and where you sit when you're in operations because you just, you worry about different parts of the world. So as a developer, it's kind of this puzzle that you get to put together where you want to build a certain product and you have these puzzle pieces that are libraries and the libraries don't quite do what you want. So you pull out your little toolbox and you pull off a hacksaw and start cutting some things up, gluing them together. And then like operations, I've got this picture, picture of a factory here. So in operations, it's like, well, how am I getting my electricity to the servers that are running this? Because I've got 10,000 servers and they use a lot of power. What happens when an electrical connector melts and catches on fire? Um, you know, what happens here is that you start thinking about everything that can go wrong. So as a developer, it's about how do I build something new that's cool, that's fun. And then in operations, it's about how does the thing break and then who starts shouting at me, do I lose my job, and so on and so forth. So, you know, when you get these two groups in a room, every time the developers want to do something new and exciting and, you know, move fast and break things like they used to say at Facebook, all the operations people, they just, they take their head and they start looking down and going, oh God, it's a new set of risks, I don't want to think about this. And so this goes back and forth, and we've done a tremendous job with DevOps tooling over the last 15 years to get developers and operations people to work together for the most part. Now, back to internet scale systems, the bad news is this is actually an operations problem, right? So on the left here, I've got a Hurricane Electric in Fremont. It's a co-location facility. You can rent each one of those cabinets. That's why they have locked doors. I used to have equipment over there. And then on the right, you've got Google, which looks mightily similar. And so these are operations problems. Something catches on fire. Just to give you a feel for this, um, if you were to cut the power to a data center just immediately, cooling shuts off, servers shut off, there's so much heat in those heat sinks in the servers that hasn't been dissipated by the cooling system yet that the whole room is gonna heat up like crazy even though there's no electricity coming in and it'll cook everything in the room. These are serious operations problems, right? So this is the type of thing that we're eventually going to need to think about if you think about a ZK-powered internet. So, um, so but a ZK-powered internet, powered internet, now you have like crypto DevOps where you already had the dev and ops dynamic, but now we're gonna add a bunch of math and elliptic curves and cryptography and stuff that like is hard to understand and you know, maybe you'd wanna go look at ZK MOOC, which is a fabulous resource, but it's also 30 hours of video to watch, all while you've got some pointy-eared boss trying to, you know, hey, we have a deadline we have to deliver. So this now is a big puzzle, and this is something that we want to sort out at Iron Mill. So let me switch gears for a minute. How you solve a puzzle like that is easy. It's time and money. Lots of time and lots of money, and a decade with unlimited cash will get some good answers, right? So why would somebody support that? Where's the business here? How do you get investors involved? And so I'm stealing a slide from my company chairman, Mike Lyons, who's been teaching entrepreneurship here at Stanford for 35 years. And you, know, you start in this high-tech initial condition, which is where we're at in ZK, and you need to build out product maturity, and by product I mean markets, so this is a very business thing. 
And then you also need to build out the deployment maturity so you can actually deliver on those markets. So you go too far up on this and you're building vaporware and you go too far to the right and it's technology with no user. Um, so we're in that high tech initial condition. If you take a look at way in the upper corner, you get the lean startup domain where you can build like a world changing app in three days. And that's when you get adoption. That's the ZK adoption that everybody's talking about. So, um, so and a great example is the App Store with Apple. You had the initial market of music and the iPod to build out the infrastructure. And then eventually you could build apps for the store. And so, you know, the, the thing is, what will the killer store app be? Nobody really knows at the start. So what did we get? Well, here's the killer app for the iPhone. This was one of the early ones, okay? Flappy Bird, right? The billions of dollars and like a decade of infrastructure and you can fly the bird through the columns and this thing's awesome. Um, now this was the most downloaded game or most downloaded free game on the App Store and somebody wrote it in three days. But you can only get there because you went all the way up this curve. In ZK, we need to do the same thing. And since we don't really know where we're headed, it speaks to we have to be able to experiment and iterate very rapidly on ZK apps. Um, and so experimentation's great. A few people have talked about that today. But then let's look at today's tooling to do that. Now, we're big fans of the Snark.js project, and I really don't mean to pick on them. But I have to walk you through their tutorial here live, and we're going to start scrolling it. It has 26 steps. And if I get real close to the screen, I can start reading them. So we start with the help command, then it's debugging. Now we get to do a powers of tau ceremony, which would presume I read a paper about KZG. And I guess we have a bunch of contributions, maybe with some third-party software. And we'll apply a random beacon, which is another paper. And it goes on and on and on and on, right? So this isn't how you iterate quickly. And we need to fix that as a community because ZK can do some really powerful things. At the end of the tutorial, by the way, they even have this, okay? Like, you know, for a software developer who's like frustrated, you know, I come from AI, ZK is new to me, I'm not a cryptographer, I've got friends who are cryptographers. Um, you know, other tutorials I've been at, oh, just debug this code here and you'll get the answer. Well, that's not a tutorial, so we need to fix this. Um, so, we have a product announcement, Oxide, which is our first uh, project from Iron Mill. And this is the start of fixing that. So what it is, is four-year-old Aaron gets a toy truck, okay, pictured above, and the toy truck does everything that a four-year-old would ask. Where do I get a circuit? That was the number one question that developers were asking us at East Denver this year, is where do I get a circuit? And then how do I make it go? That's the next thing. How do I make the circuit run? And finally, does the circuit do what I expect? And the developers were not asking that last question because they couldn't get it to run in the first place. But does it do what I expect? That's what everybody's talking about today, about sort of under-constrained circuits that actually have no security. And so Oxide addresses these issues by being a package manager. So think of it like PIP, where you just say what circuit you want, it downloads it, it's got some shims to work in some popular programming environments, and so you can grab a circuit that somebody else has written and integrate it into your code and then just start building. Um, and so we're going to alpha with Oxide. So if you would like to sign up, we have a QR code here. And um, we're looking for developer feedback. We want to build with everyone here as a community. So my background is a PhD in AI. I used to run an IT consulting company when I was younger. I do sound, as you can see. Um, there are going to be things that developers know that I don't, and so we want your input so we can build a better product, product as a community together. So by all means, sign up for the Oxide Alpha, and we're also running a hacker house this week where the Iron Mill team will be here, and you can talk with us and give us feedback, use Oxide itself. Um, speaking of the hacker house, we have a panel discussion and dinner there on Monday, which is tomorrow, and um, the panel will be Jump Crypto, Semiotic, myself, and ZK Sync. 
and we'll be having a discussion about all things ZK. Um, and this will be just located off campus on Stanford Ave, so right next to the graduate housing. You're all invited. Um, and then I will have the rest, all the QR codes up at the end in one spot if you miss one. Uh, we're running a ZK barbecue on Wednesday night, which is just come chat ZK. This particular link I'm getting, uh, it was just pointed out that it got filled up already. So, um, so let me move to the next, um, well, there'll be another contact us QR code in a minute and you can contact us there to get added to the list. Um, and I do just want to wrap up here with some comments on the verifiable internet. So the verifiable internet is what I was opening this uh, discussion up with. We're going to use ZK to build verifiable protocols across the entire internet stack, avoiding a lot of the problems you see in Web2 today. And this is a great opportunity for all of us as a community to reimagine what we want the internet to look like. Iron Mill is here to be a partner on that. I was showing you that graph earlier from my chairman's class about product maturity and deployment maturity. We're on the deployment side of things. We build practical systems that go. And so we want to partner with projects that are working on different use cases, whether it be gaming or DeFi or social media or NFTs. And anybody who wants to integrate ZK into their project and then get back to worrying about their customers and worrying about their business. We want to integrate with you to provide that infrastructure layer, and we're here to be a service to the community. So by all means, reach out to us uh, to discuss ideas or partnerships or anything else. Um, so here's all the QR codes in one spot. Uh, the alpha, we've got the Monday ZK talks, the Wednesday barbecue, if you're an investor, we're not currently raising. We closed around recently, but there will be you know, fundraising in the future, um, and we do think it's important to build community, so certainly we're happy to talk with you and meet you, especially this week, we're here at SBC. Um, and then finally, there's the contact link on the end, which is just our website, and if you'd like to come to the Wednesday barbecue, I would say send us a note on the contact link. I'm also going to tell you, and my, the rest of my company will not be happy about this, but I'm gonna give you the street address. So anybody who wants to show up and uh, not register, no promises on how much barbecue we have, but um, 679 Stanford Ave, okay? <laughs> so I'll say it again, 679 Stanford Ave, and um, it's right near Escondido Village, for those of you who knows where that is. Um, I actually used to live there in, es in Escondido Village during grad school here. Um, okay, so one last time, 679 Stanford Ave. It's on Wednesday, August 30th, starting at 5 p.m. And then finally, um, we're thrilled to be working with the group of partners and investors on this slide. Um, yeah, Gumi, Longhash, Superscript, Kestrel, Semiotic is a core developer of the graph. Um, Sevi is from Semiotic up there, and Sam Green's giving a talk, I think, later today, also with Semiotic. Uh, 7X Ventures, we're part of the Stanford Blockchain Accelerator. A big thank you to Kun and Gil especially for their efforts over the years. And we also work with Lambda Class. Um, one closing thought on the partners, too, is that we've got multiple former executives from Sun Microsystems, and there's just a big depth of experience around, um, you know, internet scale systems and how do you make big systems go. And so we want to bring that to the blockchain community. Uh, all right, I think that's it, and I think I'm pretty well out of time. So you can grab me either at the sound table, I'll be there all day today, or I'll be around the conference and definitely grab me if you want my telegram. Um, I'll be here. Cool.